We, we appreciate that. All right, so I'm, I'm going to start talking about something here for the next couple of weeks. Because it's come up a lot. I mean, there's been a lot of people asking, you know, what is that new normal going to look like? What is it going to look like? And I, I, I just, I want to tell you that, well, I'll close with this thought too. You have two choices when it comes to a new normal. You can take on the new normal that's going to come from this world and the way that they tell you that things ought to be. Or you can take on a new no- normal of doing it God's way. And I, for one, am in favor of doing our future the way that God wants us to do our future. And most of the time when you get into these situations where the heat is turned up, it seems, and lots of questions out there, we end up asking the question, what now, God? And so from from this question, I, I hope that we can establish a new normal for believers. Now, I know two weeks ago I was talking about uh, how it was in the days of, Eli- of uh, Isaiah um, and Isaiah 58. And we'll go back to that here next week or the week after. But it talked about how Israel had become complacent in their worship. And how that people of Israel had be, uh, uh, were still doing their religious stuff. They were, they were there. They were doing that stuff like they had for generations. <clears throat> and they prided themselves in seeking God as if they were a righteous people. They seek after the justice of God, it says in there, as if they had not rejected God and His ordinances. They were deceived about who they really were and about what God expected from them. And God was trying to clear it up. He was trying to make it all better. And like I said, I think we'll get back to Isaiah 58. But I want to talk today about the, the issue and time between the promises of God and the provision of those promises. And that's going to come up here in the next couple of weeks as we talk about uh, finding this new normal. And I think, I think the big question is with so many people, and, and oftentimes believers also, the question is, what now, God? What will our new normal look like? And how do we prepare for it? How do we, how do we prepare for this unchartered course that we are now on, this unknown future that we are forced into no choice of our own. What do we do when the need appears to be greater than the means? What we feel like we need or what God needs of us is greater than what we have the potential, the power, or the resources to do. And so here's one of the the best examples that I could think of from the New Testament. In John chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus Uh, Lifting up his eyes and seeing that a great multitude was coming to him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread that these may eat? And uh, this he was saying to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered, $200 worth of bread is not going to be enough for each of them to have just a little bit. Um, One of his other disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here, there's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these among so many people? Five thousand men, not counting the women and children, maybe as many as fifteen or twenty thousand people on that hillside. And Jesus said, Feed them. Give them something to eat. And the disciples in that moment, no doubt, had come to a place of where they were asking the question, what now, God? What now? I, I, I cannot predict what a new normal may look like in our world or even in the United States of America. But I think I can tell you what a new normal should look like for God's people. For you and I. You, and you have to know where you're sitting right now. At this moment in time, we are on the fringe of of whatever new normal we accept into our life. We as a church have to face the fact that we are going to launch out into a a new normal. Whatever that might look like for the world, it's probably not going to be the same for believers. I mentioned this earlier, just something that popped into my head at the time. I think um, I heard the number the other day, and I've been hearing this number for probably the last decade. We used to think that all the Christian martyrs, the people who die for their faith, happened way back in Bible times from the, you know, the mean old Romans back in those days. 
But did you know that the average number of Christians, believers, followers of Christ, who die for their faith each year is around a million? In our world today, a million Christian martyrs per year. Has anybody else ever heard that? That's what they are saying the number is. And we get comfy and cozy where we are, not knowing that the rest of the world is depending on us. People in your work and people in your neighborhood and even people in your family are counting on you and what you have with God for something to change in their life. I think there's two observations that we can get from this passage that we just read to help us create a new normal. The first one, the main one is, number one, Jesus is interested in the needs of people. These people that came to him that day were hungry. And the Bible says Jesus had compassion on them. The Bible talks about Jesus having compassion for the multitude on many occasions. He had compassion on the two blind men that followed him around. And the lepers. And he had compassion on the demon possessed. And on the widows and the lame and the sick. And the rejected. On those who were, he, the way he said it, were like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. In Luke chapter 4 verse 18 You'll know this verse when I read it, but it says um, that Jesus didn't just read this, he said it. Maybe that's the difference between us and a lot of the, the, um, what God wants out of us, is we are able to read the scripture many times, but are we able to say it as if it applies to us? Jesus said, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are, are bruised. Jesus is interested in the needs of people and has compassion on those in need. If his priority, Jesus' priority then and now, is on the poor and the brokenhearted and the captive and the blind and the bruised, not only then do you and I qualify for a miracle from God, you also qualify to be a part of a miracle of God for someone else. God wants to use you. Number two, Jesus uses those closest to Him to meet those needs. Jesus wants to use you and I. God Himself wants to use you and I to help meet the needs of other people. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that um, God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Verse 12, remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But verse 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus you who formerly were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's you and me. We're not standing on the outside looking in anymore. This is about us being close enough to Christ, being drawn near enough to Him, that now we can do good works. Now God can work through us. Now God can do better things through our life. He's calling us to that level. We are, we are now near to him because of the blood he shed for our sin, the redemption, and the new life that he has given us. We make ourselves weak and unable by being consumed with the distractions and guilt of this world. We watch all of the stuff that's happening around us all the time, and, and, and I, I'll say it, um, you, you don't have to like it or you don't even have to agree with it. But I'm telling you, if you watch more than 30 minutes or an hour of, of, of uh, mainstream media news, you're hurting yourself. And, and instead of letting all that stuff come in, find the right stuff. <clears throat> Allow God and His Word to influence you and your way of thinking. Not the social media. Not Not Facebook. Um, 
Oh, we're, we're live on Facebook. Why don't y'all give the people on Facebook a hand? Would you say welcome? <laughs> um, limit the, the influence of the world and turn more and more um, toward God. Uh, who you are on Sunday is who you are. I know that's kind of, you know, because we're, we're pretty, I don't know how you guys wake up on Sunday mornings. I, I, I don't know if it's a gentle, you know, good morning, Lord, it's Sunday. Or if it's good, Lord, it's morning. Yeah, I don't know how you do that. I, I, I go back and forth on Sundays. It just depends on how far I am and how much sleep I got. And, and I, I didn't, I, I got up at like 1.30 this morning. Not on purpose. I just woke up and I was thinking about stuff. And I thought, well, you know what? I might as well just get up and get dressed, go in the office and, and do it. So I did. But I got to lay back down at 3.30, so I don't know if I'm going to sleep today, tonight, tomorrow. I don't know. I'm all out of whack right now. And I know you're wanting to do that. Oh, you big cry, baby. But I love to wake up in the mornings and, and let God start my day. I want to start my day with Him. And, and who you are on Sunday is who you really are. You, you are made to be a new creation in Christ Jesus, right? Amen? You are forgiven. God has forgiven you. He even says that you are to live your life without condemnation because of what Christ did. Not because of how good you are. Who you are on those days, is, is uh, the other days, is a result of the world's influence. Not God's. I don't know, it, is it Tuesday that your faith begins to fade? That compromise and guilt set in, or selfishness and fear? Is it, is it Thursday? Is it Monday? God wants your best every day. He wants you at your peak performance as a child of the living God, as a witness unto Him, your peak performance, like every day is a Sunday. So here, here's the difference in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. It says, God said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Verse 17. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds will I remember no more. God is, God is trying to say, I'm going to put this in your heart and your mind. You don't have to, you don't have, to have anything else. It's going to start in here. God is not going to light a fire by night and a cloud by day to lead you into this new normal. He will deal directly with you. He will deal directly with your heart and with your mind. God said, I will put my law into your heart and into your mind. I will write it. Which means the Spirit speaks to you. The Spirit of God speaks to the Spirit of who you are. And you can be influenced by that. Or you can be influenced by what is happening around you. The Spirit speaks to you because He is in you. Paul said in Colossians 1.26 that there is a mystery that has been hidden through the ages and the generations but is now made known to the saints. We're all saints, right? You agree with that, don't you? I know not, not every religious group says that we're all saints but he's talking about all of us. You're all saints. And... and it's now made known to the saints. It has to do with the riches of His glory among the Gentiles, which is, He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you, and that is your hope of glory. It is, it is true. God is not lighting our way by night with a hot fire in the sky, nor is He pushing or pulling us forward with a, a Shekinah cloud of glory by day. What he is doing is better than either of these. He lives in you, your hope of glory. You think sometimes it's you being wise or smart in your mind, but really it's the Spirit of God speaking in you and, and, and moving you to another direction uh, and to a different thing and to a higher level. I mean, how many times has this happened to you where you're just in a conversation with somebody and you say something and, and or you send them an a, a email or, or something, and, and they say, how did you know? How did you know? That's the Spirit of God speaking in you. When you pick up the phone and you say, hey, I just had you on my mind today, and I thought I'd call and, and tell you I was praying for you. And, uh, and people say, well, I, how did you know? 
That's the Spirit of God in you. Don't you think it's time that we all make ourselves available for God's use? Set aside the, the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us and, and, then, and then stop making excuses for not doing what we know is, is the most important thing in this, in this life. Sharing our faith and giving of ourselves to the needs of others. And just stop making excuses for that and just start doing it. You know, I think one of the things, and we'll get to it in this, uh, as we talk about <clears throat> developing or creating or finding the new normal, um, <clears throat> we have to look forward into the future and say, what does it look like if for, for whatever reason church closes for good, can you handle it? Can, can you handle what I'm talking about without having a Sunday church? And it may not happen. I'm not saying it's going to. I'm not trying to prophesy anything. I'm just saying, what if we go back into a thing like we had in March where we don't get to have church? Does the church continue or does the church just stop? Well, we can't, we can't get together. I'm just saying, there's, there's, we have to do better as believers, individual believers, in spreading the gospel. And that's one of the things that we are going to work out. We're, we're going to work this out and work at it and do better than what we've done in the past. Um, we all know that Jesus came to redeem mankind, right? But there's, there's another priority, and that is preparing us, you and I, to live and continue in faith. And getting, getting saved is great. It's wonderful. Uh, no more hell, but, but you can't stop there. I mean, once, a lot of folks, once they get saved, they're like, it's done. It's a done deal. I got nothing else to worry about, nothing else to think about. I don't think the Holy Spirit lets us rest just in that. Well, there's lots of peace in the fact that we're going to go to heaven. But I, I think that intuitively we know if we are in Christ that there is something else that God wants from us. That there's something else that we should be doing, that we should be sharing, we should be serving, we should, we should be doing something that other people might come to Christ also. I don't know who it was that influenced you in your relationship with Christ, or who led you to Christ, or what their life was like, or what you've seen in them, or what that might have looked like, but you have to know that there's people around you who are looking at you, and looking for the same thing, some level of influence to bring them to a place where... Jesus is. In Jude chapter 1 verse 3 it says that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Faith is that which cannot be stolen. It can only be given away. If, if you have the faith of God, you know we know that, that uh, Romans ten seventeen says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if we have that faith working in us, nobody can take that from us. Now, you, you can try to give it away. Or you can surrender it. You can put it under a bushel or under a bed. But the truth is, is we need to be sharing that and giving that to other people. And it's worth fighting for. This faith, once delivered to the saints, is worth fighting for. It's worth working for. So let's, let's, let's all stop making excuses for not doing what we know God wants us to do. And, and, and stop. I didn't put this on the screen. And stop. Wearing things that don't fit. Um, you know, Lisa and I have gone to the beaches a few times on vacation, and we've gone to some destinations, beach destinations. And, and I, I don't know about you, and I think sometimes you can even see this in Walmart. <clears throat> where you, you just, you just want to say, don't you? That don't fit. <laughs> Change something. Stop wearing things that just don't fit. Uh, let me say that, and I'll be. <laughs> I don't think about it anymore. I can't really get it out of my head right now. But um, being on vacation does not mean it is okay to wear stuff that don't fit. When there are things in your life that don't fit who you are, get rid of it. 
some of the most valuable lessons I believe that we learn in life and faith is Roman numeral one, when the need seems greater than the means, is what causes us to say, come to those places in life where we say, what now? What now, God? What do we do? The, the, the need is humongous. The means are little. When we've tried everything else, when we've exhausted all other resources, when life's problems have snowballed into a into white out conditions, it is at that point that God is ready to do what only God can do. If we're not there as a society right now, we're very close. Joseph probably asked the question, What now, God? It wasn't bad enough that his brothers hated him and that they threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. Then, you know, some woman attacked him. And then came a knock at his door by the Egyptian police, if they had such a thing. I think he knew it was coming. What? But I think in that moment he said, what now, God? Have you ever had those moments? Where you knew that the news that was coming was bad or the, the storm that was brewing was... It looked, felt like it was there to destroy you, and, and then something else comes up. Job had the ultimate what now God experience. There, the Bible says there came a messenger unto Job that said, All your oxen and mules have been stolen, your servants killed, and I alone am escaped to tell you about it. And the Bible says while he was still speaking, there came in another one, another person that said, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, while uh, fire from heaven fell and consumed all your sheep and your servants, I only am escaped to tell you about it. And then it says, while he was still speaking, there came also another and said, all your camels have been stolen and the servants killed, and I alone am escaped to tell you. While he was still talking, another one came in and said, there came a great wind from the wilderness and knocked down the house where your sons and your daughters were gathered together. They are all dead, and I alone am escaped to tell you. What is it in your life that makes you relate to what now, God? Could it be finances? Just just when you thought things couldn't get any worse. You had new bills come in or a, a, a health problem where now you have to pay thousands in a in a copay. Gas bills, light bills, taxes, insurance. Something breaks down like the car, the water heater, washing machine. You think, what now? Could it be fear? Fear from terrorism and attacks and COVID. Only multiplied by local events of murder and accidents and robberies. And maybe even fear of your own death. Turn on the six o'clock news and you say, what? What now? Could it be relationships, you and your spouse or one of your children, some bully at school or a boss that's threatening to fire you or lay you off? Or could it be sin? A lot of people made a New Year's resolution that didn't last for one day. And it causes them to feel inadequate and ashamed. And every session of repentance is followed by a greater season of temptation. It is when difficulties are compounded that we reach the point where we look to the heaven and say, what now? What now, God? Jesus is interested in your needs and he wants to meet your needs so that he can use you to help meet the needs of others. If you can get that part working in your mind, It'll change the way you do life. I've watched people do this. I've watched people get to the point where they're like, I can't, I can't take this anymore. God, what do I need to do now? What now? And, and, and they turn and they begin to change. And I believe they, they start reaching out and talking to other people and sharing their testimony and sharing good news of the gospel with other people. And other people's lives begin to change. And it radically changes this first person. Because now they not only realize that Jesus has compassion and wants to meet the need the needs of people, but he wants to use you and I to do that. Meet the needs of other people. Roman numeral two. How can we use this point of what now, God, to create a new normal? 
And this sounds pretty negative, at least at this point. But what do we do? What can we do different? I want you to remember these four points. The first one, number one, remember this. I don't need all the answers to do what God wants done. I don't need all the answers. Sometimes people just sit and wait for the answer. Before I do anything, I just need an answer. When really you just need to exercise faith. Trust God. Joseph said after he had been made the second in command. Remember he was promoted in Egypt after all of his hard times. After all of his trouble. And then his brothers stand before him. And Joseph could have uh, pronounced judgment on them and had them all killed. Um, But he said instead, what you meant for evil. Remember Genesis 50, 20. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. He used it for good to save many people alive. Listen, faith will say what Joseph said before the good ever happens. Faith knows that God has a plan, that God is working a plan. We may not see it, and we might not have all of the answers, but we can still live and walk by faith, and He's given us His Word to challenge us and to take us to that next step, that next level. Of following after Him and trusting Him no matter what it looks like around us. If it is impossible to please God without faith, which is what Hebrews 11.6 says, then make the new normal about faith and not blame and not about revenge. I don't think that there's anything about uh, um, revenge and blame and criticism that connects with the kind of faith that God is wanting us to live with. And, and you know, people may say, well, I, I don't blame, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't seek revenge, I'm just a realist. Now, I, I'm, I understand the thing about a realist, I do, I get that, I, I understand. Philip was a realist. Jesus said, where, where can we buy bread that these may eat? Philip said, $200 won't do it. We don't have enough money in the treasury to buy enough food that everybody can have just a little bit. Right? That's, that's the attitude of a, of a realist. So then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, offers an answer, but he also had to throw in a little bit of unbelief. He said, there's a boy here with five loaves and two fish, but what are, that, what are they among so many? That's the idea of a realist. It's, it's clear what the problem was it was feeding 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Like I said, maybe as many as 15 or 20,000 on that hillside. But this was God's idea, right? I mean, this, this was Jesus' idea. Let's feed them. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to have all of the answers and a good explanation to just do what he said do. Yeah, a realist should be able to say, okay, you're saying... Feed 5,000. Feed 15,000. We know all we have, five loaves, two fish. We're not talking about, you know, 45-pound flathead here. We're not about sardine-type fish. This is what we got. Here you go. I mean, that's, that's real. Romans 8, 28, doesn't it say? All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Do you fall into that category where you just know... It doesn't look good right now. I don't have all the answers. But I can trust God that he's working some stuff out for good. I can just trust him with that. I don't see it. I can't explain it. I can't predict it, what it's going to look like. But God, this stuff is your idea, not mine. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust you with it. Let God work that out. Sometimes you have to say this by faith. Hebrews 11 recognizes the great saints of old by saying, you know, by faith. In other words, they did not have all the answers. It says, by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was translated. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, moved with fear. By faith, Abraham, being called, obeyed. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. God did not always speak to them in an audible voice or face to face. He spoke to their hearts and minds. And sometimes through circumstances, but it always required of them a level of acceptance and trust in God. God may not be writing in the sky for you or speaking to you audibly, 
But that Hebrews 11 kind of faith can work for you just like it did them. God, your word says, and I'm going to do this. I feel like in my heart, God, that you really want me to talk to that person about coming to Christ. I'm going to do it by faith. Paul said it like this. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He also said it in, in Philippians 1, six. He said, I am confident of this, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God didn't just get you saved so you can stop there. God didn't just give you salvation and apply the blood of Christ to our life just so we'd get to go to heaven and feel better about our future somehow or another. God has something more for us. I like the way that Sarah, the wife of Abraham, said it in Hebrews 11. She, it says that she judged him, God, faithful who had promised. God is faithful. God has promises in his word that we can apply to our every day. God can take whatever circumstance you might be in and use it to lift you up in a new way. Your new normal should also include this. Number two, you are not the exception to God's rule. You're not the exception. God has done great things through others. You are not the exception. He can do great things through you. God has proven his forgiveness through the generations and God will also forgive you. You are not the exception to that rule. God has revealed himself strong in people throughout human history. And God can show himself strong in anybody whose heart is right toward him. I don't remember where that verse is at. Is it 2 Chronicles 16.9? Where he said, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across the face of the whole earth. Looking for those whose hearts are perfect toward him. Not just their lives, but their hearts are perfect toward him that he might show himself strong. God wants to do that, and he wants to do that through you and I. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. You may not be able in and of yourself, but God is able. God is able to make a great nation of just one imperfect person. God is able to calm the storms and the waves that the chaos of this world has created. God can open the Red Sea for the, the, His chosen people to go across like on dry ground and then close it back in order to annihilate the enemy that came against them. God can heal the sick and give sight to the blind and raise the dead. And if God can take four lepers and cause an entire army to flee for their life, don't you think that God can make a way for you when you say, Oh God, what now? Is there anything our God can't do? Why then do so many believers sit back and wait when God says, you already know what to do. Keep, keep trusting and believing. If God can change water into wine and change the direction of the sun, don't you think he can turn your darkness into light? God is able. God is able to take you from being a victim to having the victory. And it all starts when you recognize the fact that God is at work in you. Both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's God working in you. To will and to do of His good pleasure. It is available to whosoever will. And you are not the exception to that rule. I know sometimes we feel like, well, I've got too much of a past. I've done too much stuff wrong. I don't. I don't read my Bible enough. I don't study enough. Look, let, let, let go of the excuses. And just let God begin to work in you. He's got greater things and greater plans than you can even imagine. Here's number three. What you have is enough when you give it to God. On that grassy field that day, the needs seemed greater than the means. There were five loaves and two fish, which was certainly not enough. But Jesus took the loaves and he will take what you have also, even though it's not enough. There is a miracle that takes place in the transition from my hands to his hands. 
There's a miracle that happens when we give God all that we have. Because then I believe He gives us all that He has. I believe God opens the windows and the doors for us to not only communicate with Him better, but to communicate with others better. When we lay aside all of our shortcomings and trust Him, His hands can change everything. In His hands is the miracle. But it's also the miracle in the transition when we give what we have to Him. His hands that touched blinded eyes and they could see that reached out and touched the sick and they were healed that lifted up the lame that could not walk and now all of a sudden they can walk his hands reached into the clay and formed the first man and it would hold the sun in place and heap up the mountains and carve out the valleys his hands would take the nails being driven into them from which his blood would flow that cleanses And saves humanity. From my hands to his hands. That is where. A new normal. Is shaped. It's the starting point. Give what you have to him. It will always be enough. It won't be enough in this world. What you have in and of yourself. Will never be enough in this world. But. If you'll put it into his hands. I said there's a miracle that. That that happens in the transition. But it will always be enough when we put what we have into the hands of God. It's like what Jesus meant when he said in John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. But he also says here, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. If it is God that gives you the ability to obtain wealth, which is what it says in Deuteronomy 8, that he might establish his covenant in this earth, then it is God that gives you the ability for anything else. We recognize that fact, it will transform our new normal. It's God that gives us the ability for anything. Here's the, here's the last point that, you sh- that uh, should be a part of our new normal. Number four, don't settle for living like you are dying. Live like others are dying. Living like you are dying might be dangerous for some people. It might get some people in trouble. Years ago, I talked to my, I was talking to my brother on the phone, and we we talked about some things and some death that had happened, and life that had happened, and just different things and trouble with both of them. But um, he told me about a country song. Some of y'all know this country song, "Living Live Like You're Dying." You know that song? Will you come up and sing it? So, now, I don't really know how it goes. I'm pretty sure I've heard it before. Because I, I, uh, I, I'm okay with it. I'm not saying anything about country music. I think, you know, country music is great. It's great. But when he said that to me, he said, you know, he reminded me of the song. I think we should, you know, in some ways live like we're dying. Because we, we should make the most of life. We should do all that we, all that we can, you know, live it up, enjoy life. Do your bucket list. You got a bucket list? I'm, I'm, my bucket list is a pretty short list. I'm just, <laughs> I never thought I'd live to be 59 years old. I mean, I'm like, okay. I would like to have a hole in one on the golf course. If I get around the right people, they might help me get one of those in. I think you should do all of those things. I think it's okay. But when my, when my brother brought that up, if God has ever spoke to me, he spoke to me in that moment. Live like you're dying. Yeah, I get that. But to live like you're dying is not enough. You need to live like others are dying. Like others are dying. In other words, what you do in this life can have a significant influence on where other people spend eternity. And we are all moving toward the same thing, death. Aren't we? I'm saying you can enjoy life. I, I get that. Do, you know, live like you're dying if you want to. But don't forget to live like others are dying. What do you do to prevent others from dying without Christ? Because they are dying. The new normal is the God given power to be a living testimony. For the lost people of this world 
and for the needy that are around us. I have been so impressed with, with our church, with you guys, for helping to support a society and a culture that may not have made it had it not been for you guys <clears throat> in Kenya. I've just, I have, I just, we're going to get those guys on the phone here one of the day, one day, and you're going you're gonna to see them up on the screen. They're going to see you. We're going to be able to talk back and forth. I've just been so impressed. But you know, that's what God calls us to do. That's what God gives us the power to do. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. God gives you power so that you can be that witness that He wants you to be. God's putting something into you so that He can get something out of you and into someone else. Don't get, don't get hung up on the, the, the things that religion has turned all this into. I just get hung up on the truth of God's Word and do what He said. If He said He'll give you power to be a witness, start to be a witness. You don't have to go to the uttermost part of the earth. Start, start in your own house. Start in your own neighborhood. Start on your job. You are never more like Christ. And you're never more in the center of God's will than when you are dealing with the needs of those dying around you. They may not be dying physically like we see, you know, somebody sick or ill, but they're all dying. We are all dying. We're going to die. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. We must, we must receive the power that God gives us that Jesus promised us and become witnesses that others might see. Let's all stand together if you would with your heads bowed. <clears throat> the question is this new normal. It's going to go one of two ways in your life and in your life specifically. Your new normal will either be, will either be influenced and established by the world and its system or your new normal will come from the promises and the power of God. I want to encourage you like never before. Let us as a church make, and as individuals, make a decision. The new normal that I create is going to be in Christ and in His Word. I'm not going to go backwards. I'm not going the other way. I'm not going to just allow whatever this world wants to do. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to make a stand once and for all. To be everything that God wants me to be. I'm going to learn more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read more. I'm going to serve more. I'm going to love more. I'm, I'm going to be this person that God wants me to be. Because according to this and according to God's promises, as I become what God wants me to be, He gives me the power to be more. Not in a weird way. Not in a harmful way. The power that He gives is for us to be a witness to others. Heavenly Father, I'm asking that for each one of us in this room today that we do that self-evaluation where we ask ourselves the tough questions, where we come to a solid conclusion concerning what we want our new normal to be. Do we want it to be more like this world or do we want it to be more like Your Word and Christ in us, the hope of glory? And then may everything that we do be a declaration to the world and those around us. This is where we are headed. This is where God has taken me. Someone else should join me in this venture. God, there's people that are lost around us. And I'm, I'm asking that you would give each one of us the strength, the courage, and the words to share faith with them that they might know Christ God I ask that you'd watch over and protect each person in this room I am so thankful for this group of friends and family the way that you take us um, step by step into new territory keep them safe keep them healthy as they make these new commitments to you and as we press toward a new normal as a church the body of Christ as a whole not just cornerstone a new normal 
as a church. There's nothing more important than sharing our faith, being a witness and a testimony unto Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask these things in the great name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand. Look, God bless you. Love you. Glad to see you today. Hope the rest of your week goes wonderful. Bye-bye.